Life is absolutely fantastic after my transplant. Uh, it's never been better. My energy level has gone way up. I mean, I'm doing things now that I was doing when I was 25. I run four miles a day. I can swim a mile in a pool. I started playing squash a couple of months ago. I'm out walking, I'm out running, I'm out doing everybody, and I'm, I'll be 69 this year. I've managed to play, uh, continue my sports at a, a you know, very high level, and uh, fitness-wise, I'm in uh, tremendous shape. Now I'm back to 100% and probably better than that. It feels wonderful. There's nothing more rewarding than seeing our transplant patients do well after their surgery. And part of those success stories that we see day in and day out in the transplant program is when patients take responsibility for their health. For patients and their families, there's a lot of information that they need to take in, a lot they need to know about, not only about caring for their organ, but for also being on guard for signs and symptoms of potential dangers, potential complications following the transplantation process. The risk of infection is a complication faced by every transplant patient. The purpose of this video is to help you understand exactly what infection is and what that might mean to you. It means perhaps new medication, it may mean a change in routine, it may mean a decrease in health for a period of time. The key is the sooner we can identify these issues, the sooner the transplant team can find out about them, the sooner we can treat them and the better the outcome is in the long run. During the first year of transplantation is the most susceptible time to infection and that's why they need to be aware of all the signs and symptoms of infection and to call a transplant team as soon as there is any sign and symptom. General signs and symptoms of infection include a temperature of greater than 37.5, flu-like symptoms, possibly diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, and just a general feeling of malaise. Patients should be checking their temperature at home at least once a day and if it's 37.5 degrees Celsius or greater for several hours, they should notify the transplant team. At first it's a little bit scary when you hear that um, you have infections and you realize that your immune system is, is quite heavily suppressed at that point. It started with a fever and it wasn't that high but we came in just in case because it had been so close to the transplant we were still so nervous about a lot of things. and. Um, and then the fever just got higher and higher. They realized uh, after the scan that uh, I appeared to have about three different infections on the go at that point. I've had a couple of different weird type infections that the normal everyday walking around person wouldn't get at all, but because I'm immune suppressed, I get them. All transplant patients are prescribed drugs that affect their immune system. The immune system is your body's natural defense against invasion from cold and flu viruses, bacteria, and other foreign bodies, including your new organ. The immune system operates through the bloodstream. Here, specific types of cells, called T cells, are on constant lookout for foreign invaders. When they recognize something that doesn't belong, for example, a cold virus, they send out a signal, bringing in whole armies of other T-cells to kill off the invader. Your prescribed medications affect this defense system and protect your new organ. However, they also lower your resistance to other health complications. It is therefore very important to take your medications exactly as prescribed, monitor the results very closely, and report any signs or symptoms as soon as you notice them. I'm on 13 medications and I take them very conscientiously every day at the same time. It might take a, um, a bit of getting used to at the beginning, maybe for the first couple of months, because you're, you want to make sure you don't miss taking your medication, but um, after a while it's, it's, it's nothing, you just, it's automatic. Respiratory tract infections, which are one of several common types of infections which transplant patients may experience, are most likely during the winter months, when cold and flu viruses are quite common. If the patient was experiencing an upper respiratory infection, they need to call their transplant coordinator and let them know the symptoms. Uh, those symptoms may be watched for 24 hours, or the patient may be brought in okay. to see the physician and, and possibly get started on antibiotics. Viruses typically are not treated with antibiotics, so there may be times when we have to just really watch the patient carefully and see whether it progresses into the chest. 
Infection was always a concern for me because we knew what the risks were when we were getting involved with the whole process because infection is a major problem with transplantation, especially with the patients with cystic fibrosis because we have infection in our system all the time and even after transplant, it's still an issue. About two days after the transplant, they realized that I had an infection and the infection that I had was because of my cystic fibrosis. It was one of the complications that is related to that kind of a transplant with our, you know, my type of disease. Another common type of infection is urinary tract infection, caused by bacteria entering the urinary system. It might not accompany a temperature of greater than 37.5, but you will note that there will be a lot of problems urinating. The signs and symptoms of urinary tract infection would be uh, burning when the patient uh, urinates. They may have frequency and when they actually go to the washroom they only may pass dribbles of urine. They may not have a lot of urine but it's really irritating the inside of the bladder. They can't wait to empty their bladder. Um, again they may have a fever. Um, the urine may smell foul smelling and if they look at it, it may look cloudy as well. If you are a kidney transplant, this type of infection should be looked after right away as for obvious reasons, it could very well affect the transplanted kidney. Urinary tract infection can be treated very simply by antibiotics by mouth and it, once it's treated it will subside. Wound infection is another common complication after transplant. It may occur along the incision line after surgery where the skin has been secured with staples or clips, or with any wound acquired after surgery that doesn't heal well. If there are problems with the incision, it may require to be opened up just a little bit and a little packing put in place. What can the patient look for? Well, they can look for about five different things. Temperature, redness, swelling, pain, and discharge. And number one is always temperature. They can take their temperature with their own thermometer, and if the temperature is above 37.5, that might tell us that there's a bit of a problem with infection coming up. Or they can feel their incision line, and if the incision line feels hot, then that can tell us that infection could be there just underneath the skin. Redness is something they should look for, so if the incision is reddened or swollen, that gives us more information too. And if it's new pain that hasn't been there before. Also discharge, if there's a change in the drainage from the wound and if the discharge increases in quantity or if the colour changes, for example, if it turns green, green needs to be seen. A wound infection could also be a cut that you've recently had or perhaps a, a bite or a scrape. If that becomes swollen, inflamed, sore, has some drainage, we'd like to know about it so it can be dealt with appropriately. A wound infection needs to be dealt with quickly. We need to know about it and if we don't know about it we can't help. But if we know about it we can deal with it with either the dressing or appropriate medication. Another common infection is known as cytomegalovirus, or CMV. It's a very common virus that's sort of in the same group of viruses that cause mono and that cause chicken pox. Your risk of getting a serious infection due to CMV is quite different depending on what type of transplant you have, the types of immunosuppression you have, whether you've had problems with rejection or not. The important thing to remember is that CMV is a very treatable virus. CMV is a flu-like virus that presents with chills, a fever, uh, it can present with shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anything that really that you would associate with the flu or a cold. It's a very manageable problem in that we have uh, very good therapy to prevent it, we have good therapy for treatment of the disease, and we have good diagnostic tests that can tell us when patients have the disease. It can be very serious if it's left untreated. We want patients to know that it's an illness that we can expect at some point, that we know that they could be possibly exposed to, but that we want to identify it early, we want to treat it early, and it shouldn't cause further problems for them. The patient's role uh, with respect to CMV disease is really looking out for the symptoms and contacting their physician or the transplant coordinator or coming to hospital at the first sign of symptoms. I was at a routine ophthalmologist examination and the ophthalmologist noticed a, um, a difference in my eye and he said, 
did you pick up anything in the hospital? And I relayed that to the transplant team, and they said, oh, better check for CMV, and they did the test, and sure enough, uh, it was there. Prior to transplant, I had been tested, and it had been determined that I had been exposed to CMV uh, somewhere in my younger years, as had my donor. My donor had also been tested, and had been tested positive for CMV. Basically, it was tran uh, transmitted through, uh, through my sister, who's a donor, and she had that uh, virus in her system. Theoretically, with both of us testing positive, I should not have had a CMV problem, but uh, with the rejection problem and the fact that uh, a lot of, of um, suppression was given to me to deal with the rejection problem, CMV managed to come back. The second time it arose, I was already sort of back at work and I was able to work my work schedule around it such that I could uh, get it in the morning, go in a bit late to work, come home a bit early, get it in the evening, that sort of thing. The only other thing about it was that uh, you tend to feel kind of dragged out and tired uh, on these drugs. If anyone feels like they have any symptoms, any of these symptoms, or anything else that might show infection, the best thing to do is to notify your transplant team immediately. You will be getting advice like, is there any burning on urination? Do you have a cough? Is there any sputum production? Are there any sores in your mouth? And generally, describe how you're feeling exactly. You may have to come down to the hospital for further tests. You may need blood tests, chest x-rays, and you may be, need to be admitted to the hospital for IV antibiotics. If you're really worried about how you're feeling, then you should come down to the emergency room and get it checked out. When it comes to infection, I think the key to it is to find out as soon as possible when you're becoming infected. And the way to do that is to follow the procedures that your transplant coordinator and doctors and nurses tell you what you should do after transplant. At the beginning that can make you a little bit paranoid or a lot paranoid, you know, and, and because you're really looking for things, but as time goes by you, you sort of have an idea that like this is okay but this isn't. It is very important that you are able to recognize the warning signs of infection. Again, they are a fever of 37.5 degrees Celsius or higher flu-like symptoms, problems breathing, discomfort, pain or redness around incisions, and changes or problems urinating. Remember, the risk of infection is a complication faced by every transplant patient. Your transplant team has the information you need to know. The transplant team works with the patient and their family to make sure that the patient has adequate information, adequate knowledge to make sure they can monitor their ongoing health status and notify us as soon as there's any small problem. The transplant team is committed to making sure that our patients receive the best quality of life, the best quality health they can possibly have after transplant. When you read about these things prior to your transplant, it's pretty scary stuff. Um, it's all laid out for you. and no uncertain terms, uh, and certainly it's, uh, it's a very serious situation, but again it's something that, uh, that can be dealt with. The team that um, is behind you is the greatest. Doctors, nurses and coordinators, you'll be surprised, they don't miss anything. They're an incredibly supportive group of people and things that might seem at some time, sometimes overwhelming or daunting. Um, they make everything just feel okay and that you're going to be just fine. If something starts to, you know, feel not quite right, I call my coordinator um, and uh, she takes it from there. Really, it's your own responsibility to make sure that you stay on top of it. If you have any suspicion at all, give them a call. It's, it's a piece of cake and they'll make sure, they'll check it out and make sure that, that you're fine.